Okay, uh, Adrian's ready. And so uh, it's now 10.05 on the 2nd of October. And this is the first of what could be a, uh, some nice get togethers. Uh, opportunity just to come together as friends and family and talk about Rondo, the old Rondo neighborhood and the people and the places and the memories that made up that wonderful community. My name is Marvin Roger Anderson. Uh, for the past 34 years, I've been a co-founder and involved in the Rondo Day celebration that we celebrate every July. Uh, three years ago, I was appointed by the board of directors of the uh, Rondo Avenue to be the project director for the new Rondo Commemorative Plaza which will be a plaza to be built on the corner of Fisk and Old Rondo Concordia. For those of you from the community, you, you might remember it as McGill's Grocery Store that was there at Fisk and Rondo, built in 1916. Subsequently, it had many other purposes before it became the VFW, which was the last use of the building before it, it caught fire. Um, I'm going to have you take some time to go around the room and please give your name and your, your, your affiliation, if any, and whether or not you were born in Rondo and kind of what you're looking for on this today, which in my mind is just an opportunity to open a dialogue and a conversation among mm -hmm. friends. Yes. And we'll take it from there. So. I want to, well, I'll let you introduce Thank yourself, you. but I'm Thank working you. with this young lady right here on this program. Thank you. I'm Robin Dorso. I'm the executive director of the Jewish Historical Society of the Upper Midwest. And um, in a funny coincidence, I know Mr. Anderson from the early 1990s when he was at the State Law Library and I was a law clerk over at the State Senate. Mm -hmm. So our connection goes back a long time. We haven't seen each other for a very long time. So this is wonderful. Um, so I agree that, that it's terrific to start a conversation. I, of course, am looking further into the future and really hoping, well, I should back up. The Jewish Historical Society of the Upper Midwest um, is in the process of beginning a Jewish St. Paul history project. And we have received a legacy grant to begin taking oral histories. So we are in the very early stages of this. Um, my hope is that we can combine it with an African-American history of St. Paul because the two communities lived in such mm -hmm. close proximity and has, has so much in common. I'm um, not, a, I did not grow up in the Rondo neighborhood. Um, however, my mother grew up at 698 Fuller Avenue, right in the heart of Rondo. And um, my mother and my three older siblings spent many, many years in the, I believe, 700 block of Ashland Avenue. So we come from this area. By the time I was born, we were in Highland. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do have a lot of, while I don't have personal memories, I feel like I have communal memories of this area. Mm -hmm. And it is really my fondest wish that our history project can be a joint project of the two communities. I'm Jonathan Palmer. I'm the executive director for Halle Keebron Community Center here. And I also have a unique connection to, to Marvin. Marvin seems to be the gathering point for everybody <laughs> around the Eastern community. Um, I went to Morehouse and followed very much in Marvin's footsteps in terms of um, organizing with the local chapter and uh, having a passion for the Rondo history. Uh, I'm not actually from this area at all. I'm from the East Coast, um, but I came out here uh, over 20 years ago, my uncle was Gleason Glover, who was the president of Minneapolis Urban League for 26 years. And he brought me out and said, I'm going to show you what you're going to do with your life. And <laughs> I mentioned under him and mentioned under Marvin and uh, ended up doing this kind of thing. So I am also very excited about this. Um, Dawn has been our, she's going to introduce herself, but Dawn has been our lead person with all of our history projects. And history is such an important part of our roots, but 
the community as a whole. So <laughs> the more that we can dig into this, the more that we can uncover the stories and share this information, the better it is for our generations, the better it is for actually writing our own history yes. and not have it be written by somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about the future of this and where we can go. Uh, good morning, my name is Eric Levinson. Um, I also am not born and raised in the Rondo community. I've lived in Woodbury for uh, almost 30 years. Um, but I'm a member of a Mount Zion Temple uh, just over here at Hamlin and uh, Summit. And um, at all, I'm also the board chair here at Halle Q. Brown. So, um, so I look forward to you know, ways to connect and reconnect the uh, Jewish and African communities, African American communities here in the Rondo neighborhood and um, anything I can do to help that. So, thank you. My name is Gloria Presley Massey, and I did grow up in the Rondo neighborhood. Actually, I'm a member, a long member of the Valley King Brown Center, and my picture really is all over this place. <laughs> I'm, uh, I went to school, I graduated high school, and of course I um, worked after, after, after uh, graduating. Um, I'm very proud to, to have been a part of the history. I love going down memory lane, that's why I'm here today. I want to hear some of the stories, uh, but uh, my most uh, thing that I'm proud of is that I'm a part of that Voices of Rondo book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why I'm here to continue uh, with the history because it is important for uh, those that are going to be following us. Yes. My name is Dawn Sully, and I'm the Manager of External Affairs and Development here at Halle Q. Brown Community Center. I did not grow up in the Rondo neighborhood. I feel as though I have, thanks to some of these ladies and gentlemen in the room hearing the stories and hearing the history. Um, I'm very excited that we can all come together to be a part of this. As I tell our group all the time, you're making history by identifying history. And that's what we need to do. And Gloria said something the other day when we were in another meeting and she said she is here to make sure her nieces and nephews know the stories of Rondo. And I think that's something that we all want, whether it's nieces, nephews, neighbors, friends, a new generation, we want them all to hear the stories of Rondo. And not to forget, this was a great, phenomenal community that was a mixture of a lot of people. And so I thank you guys for coming into our Hallie Q. Brown house today to share your stories. My name is Gail Payne Foreman, and I was born and raised um, in Rondo. I'm here for my parents, Mr. Billy Payne and Mrs. Dorothy Payne, and my children and my grandchildren <coughs> to keep that history going. Um, we have always been a part of the Rondo, and when Roger um, and Floyd began this wonderful vision. We were so excited about it. And I live right across the street. And so um, when the parade started, people would go past and I would be sitting there with my fan and people would look up. And it was it just the camaraderie was so rich and so wonderful because it was like the way we were all born and raised up. My um, friends we knew for a lifetime. Gloria and I the, the history is here, and I'm here because I'm a part of this, and I'm happy to share what I can share with the rest of you all, okay? Hey, uh, I'm Steve Cloner. Uh, my roots go back to the old west side of St. Paul, but that's not our real focus here. I did spend all of my formidable years on uh, 727 Laurel, and I went to the schools of Webster, Marshall Junior High, St. Paul Central, okay? Uh, I grew up with many people from the community here. Uh, and I read many of the books as time went on, Voices of Rondo, people that I knew and went to school with, okay? 
So um, Norma got me, uh, contacted me about this, and I was really amazed at all that I could recall and remember of so many memories back, mm -hmm. you know, of so many events and places and things. So that's why I'm here, is to contribute what I can recall and everything and my experiences. So, And I was a school patrol boy, if anybody was <laughs> I don't know if they still have that, but they did in my day. Norma? I'm Norma Schweiker. My maiden name was Bernstein. Um, we lived at 661 Laurel. Uh, my parents, my grandparents actually, um, moved there in 1920 and we lived there until 1960. Uh, my father was one of nine children. So they needed some space, obviously. <coughs> we were always told that it was a very famous house before we moved into it. But we could never find anything about what was famous about it until one day I was at the Ramsey County Historical Society and a gentleman there pulled out a um, letter that was written by a lady in 1999, unfortunately she had passed away by the time I tried to reach her, but they were from the Bockstrock family, from Bockstrock the jeweler. So we then understood why there were maid calls on the wall, needless to say we had no maids. Um, but we had a lot of fun with them. So I met with that family and uh, the reason they sold the house was because Mr. Backstrap had died and the family did not want to live in there any longer. Um, too many memories. And so um, my grandfather was able to buy the home for $4,000, of which everybody gathered their little coins and, um, and they purchased it. Um, that home was my home until 1960. And the reason we moved from the home in 1960 was because my grandfather passed away and my father did not, um, did want, not want to live in the same home. By that time, about four years sooner, most of the Jewish people had moved away from that neighborhood. All of the Jewish institutions had moved away from that neighborhood. And so my parents, my father, because we had only one car, would be driving us back and forth to Highland Park for religious school five days a week, and um, et cetera, et cetera. And most of our Jewish friends Except Steve, yeah. and that's about what we were um, in that neighborhood. I have got to tell you that I never knew what part of the neighborhood I lived in. Um, I didn't know what religion people were. Obviously, I knew what color people were. Um, quite obvious, and somehow people knew what religion I was which was not the easiest, but my parents said, if you're in a foxhole, nobody asks you what you are. You just take care of each other and try to survive. And that's the way I grew up. Um, so I have always, anything I go to, I have always wondered why some people cannot get along. We had people of all color, all religions, of all kinds that lived in our home so that my family could afford to live in the house once the children started moving away. We combined ourselves into rooms so that a room could be rented out to bring in extra income. Um, the home is absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal. If my mother could only see it, hardwood floors in the basement, we had a dirt floor. In a central heating, we had coal that my father would shovel every day. 
Um, this was by no means, I mean, to look at the house, you would think we were wealthy people. We weren't. We were just like everybody else that lived around us, and we knew it. Nobody was any better than anybody else. So I was reading the Voices of Rondo and the 500-page book on Rondo, and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, where are people like us? I was amazed. And so I did a little bit of digging here and digging there, and I got a hold of Marvin Anderson. <laughs> I have got to tell you, the history of the house that Marvin Anderson lives in is unbelievable. If yours could talk. Um, it started out, and my friend Meryl from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, went to school in Marvin's house. It was a seven-day Adventist school. I met Meryl due to my friend Barbara Malice, who worked at the St. Paul Library. She's not even from here. She's from Germany. Yes, she had Jewish roots places, you know. Um, and we hit it off right away. <coughs> Where's the information about Selby Avenue? Nobody has any information about Selby Avenue. Where's the association? Where's the anything? And so I thought, you know what, this is not, this is not gonna fly. My family worked too hard, and other families worked too hard to keep the area going. And, uh, and so little by little, well then it turned out that after the Seven Day Adventist, um, my grandfather attended a synagogue in Marvin Anderson's house which was for men only. It was uh, during the week service. And uh, I went in there a couple times with my grandfather when nobody else was looking and because I just couldn't figure out why only men could go into a building. And, um, and the building next to it, which is absolutely gorgeous, um, was the high holiday service because women then went to it. Um, so my roots go way back. Okay, so we can move yes. around here, then we'll get into more details. Sorry. Of that. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. I'm John Lindley. I am the editor for the Randy County Historical Society. This is our quarterly history magazine, uh, just a typical copy. I can pass this around if you want to see it. Uh, I'm Thank here you. because I am supporting Robin and Norma and Mark uh, uh, in this activity, and I am hopeful that out of it will come more information because of the historical society. That's what we want. I didn't grow up here, so <laughs> I have nothing to contribute in the way of memories of the area. Hi, my name is Richard Strimling. I'm born and raised St. Paul, Dayton and Chatsworth. I'm a year ahead of Marvin and Gail and um, JJ Hill and Central. I'm several years older than Yusuf. Um, he's a kid. Two or three. <laughs> kid. But the community, the community was everything. Um, your memories, your fondness, and um, we'll, we'll get into it more. If there wasn't a freeway built, we might not all be sitting here. Mm -hmm. um, today, for the commercial street of Selby, uh, with the stores there were part of my growing up shopping mm -hmm. uh, experience. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Heather too, and Square Deal Liquor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, my name is Obedia Thomas, and uh, I wasn't born in Minnesota born in Louisiana, and we came up here in 1944, and we lived on 908 Carroll, and we went to Pilgrim Baptist Church, and went to Hills, uh, J.J. Hill School of Marshall, and that's it. My name is Merrill Levickson. I've lived in Iowa now since 1949, but I grew up mostly in this neighborhood. I can't say that 
like some of you say, they lived at such and such an address. Mm -hmm. I probably have 20 or 30 of those addresses. <laughs> I got all, pictures of all the houses that still exist in this. In, I've written an article about all the homes I lived in. And I've lived in about 40 homes. And uh, I think I had a wonderful life. <laughs> Uh, I know we got, we had to leave homes because we couldn't pay the rent and uh, some, somehow my folks found another place. And I was still having a ball. It was a wonderful neighborhood. And I remember especially one of the, Louis, there was a guy named Louis House who was in school when I was in school. And Louis House, I didn't know him well because he always, he went to Marshall, but he went back to Rondo after school, and he wasn't in the neighborhood very often. But I got to know him enough, and I remember a game we played. He and I happened to go to a, out by, behind Central High School in Houston. A bunch of guys were just gathering, and they were going to, they were going to choose up sides, and uh, and I was hoping I'd get on the same side as Louis because I admired Louis. I think Louis was a year or two younger than me, but but I was I I, I, I liked the guy, and uh, he didn't. We got on different teams, and 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 a big event in my life happened in that game because I was playing on the defense on one side, and he was on the offense on the other side. And he was coming down, he had he'd made about a 30-yard gain on his work, and I'm edging him over toward the sidelines and, and um, <coughs> thinking that, that I'm going to stop him. Well, he, just before I could tackle him, he stepped out of bounds. And I thought to myself, by gosh, he got 30 yards, he deserves a little punishment. <laughs> And so I tackled him out of bounds. And of course, as soon as I was through tackling him out of bounds, I had those guilty things. You know, this, is a, this is a terrible thing to tackle the guy when he's not, he's not eligible for being tackled. And I'm thinking, I said, what's he going to do? Is he going to get up mad? Is he going to hit me? Is he going to, what, what, what kind of a terrible thing? <laughs> is he going to call me names or anything like that? And all the things I thought of he, he couldn't do hit me, you know, anything. And so, but when we were getting up, he helps me get to my feet, and he says, nice tackle, Merrill. And I never, <laughs> I've never forgotten. I've written that story three times at least. I was gonna send it to the, to what's that little magazine that, that takes the little stories like that. And I was going to send it to the St. Paul paper. I never get around to it. I wrote it three times, and I never, I still got it. I think I'm going to put it, I'm going to send it to whoever is collecting all this data, because I will never forget him. And I remember the last time I saw him, I had, my, my wife, my wife-to-be was from Minneapolis, and I was taking her to a football game when, it, when the new stadium was next to Central High School. And as we were leaving, I ran into to him and uh, I introduced him to my wife. And I, I still admire him. He's one of the people. I, th I believe he changed my life. I think I quit being a guy that could tackle <laughs> um, my name is Barbara Malice, and I'm just retired from the St. Paul Public Library, where I was a librarian and I managed the St. Paul collection. Um, I was not uh, born here, as Norma mentioned. I'm from Trier in Germany, the oldest city. And um, I'm just, I'm very honored to be invited to this circle 
to this meeting. Um, I'm very excited that this dialogue starts with Hondo, with Selby Avenue. And I just would like to say that, um, yes, it was Norma came to the St. Paul uh, Library and asked about materials on Selby Avenue. And I found a few things like um, Ramsey County History Magazine, and I was amazed. I thought, there isn't much written about this. This is such a cool street, and I heard your stories. And um, so I checked with my colleagues, and they said, no, there is not much. I thought, this is incredible. Something has to happen here. So I'm so delighted, and I, about this exchange of of memories, of history, and I hope that everything will be preserved for people that come afterwards. Thank you so much. <coughs> we had a couple of new people, if they would do the same. Sure. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Yusuf M. Jenny. My nickname was Charles Crane Joachim Anderson III. And I was born and raised in this community. Um, where to begin? Uh, there were lots of Jewish businessmen in this community after the Jewish community moved out. There was Martin Abelovitz, Abel's Grocery Store in Grotto, John Cotler, the attorney, at his office on Dale and Selby. And many of the original African American churches were located in what formerly had been synagogues, which is a story familiar to people in major urban areas throughout the United States. Central High School, uh, when I first attended in 1964, had 5,600 students. And the first shift began at about 6.15 in the morning. The last shift began after 9 o'clock. And the African American and Jewish community in St. Paul were very tight uh, because of sharing classes, participating in athletics and other after school activities. And that did not change until Highland Park Senior High School was built. And I think that was 1964 64. or 65. 64. Mm -hmm. The younger side. No, that senior high school. It split Central High School in half. Horrible. And Wilson High School was closed, and the students from Wilson High School had always been opponents of Central and Horrible. attended Central. And the, the school spirit just sort of went right down what Archie Bunker would call the Turlet yeah. in Central High School. Yeah. Uh, Central was the school, it had a waiting list five years long because all the teachers wanted to teach there. It had the best athletic debate and all of the other uh, group activities, athletic sports in the entire city. Um, there were two Jewish brothers who lived, Mary Kay helped me, on Idleheart and Milton. One's name was Max, and they used to sell newspapers downtown. Was it Goldberg? I believe it was, yeah. And um, they lived in the community up into the early 2000s. Uh, there were other isolated Jewish families, but growing up in Rondo, if you were an African American, you couldn't live east of Farrington, west of Oxford, north of Dayton, you were one of the lucky ones there, you lived on the south side of Dayton. And uh, you couldn't live on the north side of Aurora. So we were really a sheltered, contained community. And the only thing that most kids learned about this neighborhood was how to stay the hell out of it. And the one thing that we learned was not to leave our parents' voices and to stay uh, primarily within the geographic boundaries of the Rondo, Selby Vale, some of the university <coughs> neighborhood, and then gradually it would expand a half block at a time, yeah. north and south, and then there were a handful of African Americans who moved into what is now Lexington Hamlin and Roseville and surrounding communities after black people in this community and Jewish allies worked in the Minnesota legislature in the 1950s on open housing legislation. Okay, I can remember when black people couldn't get a credit card, Jewish people couldn't get a job or a credit card in Dayton's department mm -hmm. store, and Minneapolis was one of the most anti-Semitic cities in the United States. And a lot of people have either forgotten or want to forget or misremember how bad the situation was here. But the interesting thing is that in the 1950s, 
If you looked at the African American community in St. Paul, it had the highest rates of literacy, it had the highest rates of uh, education, it had the highest rates of home ownership, it earned the highest <coughs> percentage of the salaries of white males who were in the same positions as black males of any metropolitan area in the country. And if you look at it today, we have um, the highest percentage of people of color and poverty of the 25 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, according to the Metropolitan Council's research. And Sam Myers, who is uh, an economist at the Humphrey Institute, the Roy Wilkins Chair at the university, did some of the historical uh, econometrics to look at the status of African-American people in this community in the 1950s and then looking at it at the, the turn of the century. So there's been a significant change. Um, we grew up on Western and Aurora, on Dale and Aguilar, uh, 519 Carroll, which was <coughs> Jones Road from here. That's right. Um, and you lived at the end of the block. Yes. Uh, there was uh, Michaud's grocery store. And there were so many yes. incredible things. It was a very sheltered community mm -hmm. for African Americans because of the extended family concept. And it didn't matter where you migrated or came from or what you had. This was a very inclusive community. When Japanese wanted to be released from internment camps, they would not release them on the coast. They came to the Midwest, so they lived in Rondo. When um, Chicano Latino families left the fields in the Red River Valley and wanted to make a stay here, they lived in Rondo. When poor white people came down from the Iron Range or from the Dakotas or Iowa, they were welcomed and uh, received in this community. And anytime somebody got sick, everybody on the block would contribute food, would help clean house, would cut the grass. We had to cut hedges. The girls had to iron, they had to sew, they had to do all of those things. And it was a very inclusive community. It didn't matter where people came from. So um, what, what I remember and what I recall uh, growing up in this community, apart from the, the, the pillow that my father brought home from the Great Northern Railroad that I slept on for 25 <laughs> years, I wish I had today, was this, this sort of protective embryo that surrounded this community and everybody in it. And we used to go five or six blocks from home and we'd set bottles up on somebody's back wall or their fence and throw rocks at them. And it didn't matter whether she was white, Chicano, Latino, Jewish, black. Somebody's mother or grandmother would stick her head out to them and say, boy, if you don't quit throwing them rocks, I'm coming out there and whoop your ass. <laughs> and I'm going to call your grandmother. You want them bad ass boys. And you're going to get a whipping when you get home. And we would say, oh my goodness, the devil must have made me do it. Please don't call, don't call my grandmother. It'll never happen again. We would scurry on up the alley or up the street and get away. But uh, we went to school with the Apple Bombs, with the Rosenbaums, with the Horowitz, with uh, you know uh, a lot of our best friends lived in Highland Park, attended Central High School, and uh, when when Central split up, I don't think it has ever been the same uh, for for the school or for people in the community or for the <coughs> people in Island Park. And when Tommy Bruce sings today, uh, some of the Applebaum girls and others still go to uh, the clubs where he's performing because they were friends in high school at St. Paul Central. So there, there are a lot of endearing relationships that continue and uh, they, were, uh, <coughs> they were average, but they were still very special. You talked about Voices of Rondo, Kate Cabot, who edited oh. that book was Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there have been, you know, the Greenmans for years, Claire and her husband were active <clears> in the St. <throat> Paul Urban League Board of Directors for probably 30 years. Um, and there have been a lot of individual Jewish families or individuals who have had significant involvement in uh, the leadership of African American organizations. In fact, if you go in, his library right across the hall, you'll see a number of Jewish people who served on the board of Alec and Brown. Mm -hmm. So, uh, pleased to be with you this morning. Thank you. Participate Thank you. in the conversation. All right, great. Mary Kay. What are we doing here? We're just inter <laughs> we're introducing ourselves and we're telling a short story. My name is Mary Kay, which stands for Colleen Murray Boyd. 
And I lived at 293 North Chatsworth with my grandparents, LL and Calgary. And then at 836 Idaho Park with James T. and Lavinia Murray, my parents. One from mother from Kentucky and daddy from uh, Mississippi. I remember Rondo as the container. I call it the geographical container because we don't have that now that had values. And no matter where you came from, we had values that everybody here to the midnight, and everybody raised everybody else's children. And one of my close friends today, <coughs> still, I guess the story I'll tell is about Susan Mackay. And she and I met, and, and she lived just a little south. I can't remember the exact address of Marshall. And we met in um, kindergarten. And she was a very shy, I, I, she's wonderful at remembering these stories, and she recalled it for me. She was very shy and very afraid. Uh, her older sister Betsy used to, you remember Betsy? And yeah, Betsy used to kind of, over, kind of uh, oversee and take care of her. And she got sick and tired of coming out of the kindergarten class and looking after Susan. So Susan said that, I stepped up and I said that I would be her friend and I would be her protector and I would look after her. So that was in kindergarten and we have been friends for all these years and in fact we talk two or three times a week. But in that community there were people from, um, I'm so glad that you brought that to our attention. Mm -hmm. Another good friend was from Latvia. And regardless of where you came from, we learned from each other because the, the diversity was so rich. It was so very rich, and the friendships have endured. So uh, whatever else, uh, there are many, 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 many stories that could be told, but um, I think you want to go on with the conversation. Great, now we, um, are there, is there anyone else would like to say something that uh, you don't have to be from Rondo? Um, we're trying to start a dialogue here with the Rondo community and the, the Jewish community, our neighbors. So if anybody's back there would like to say something, please feel free to do so. <clears throat> else we're going to take our second round around the room here. Well, I'll just sure. say, uh, my name's Noel Nix. I'm the Forensic County Commissioner in Tony Carter's office. Uh, who sits on the board of the Reconnect Rondo Initiative mm -hmm. um, that perhaps folks know about. Um, so uh, we had gotten the notice and just wanted to stop in and uh, hear some of the stories before uh, going back into the office. So okay. thank you all for Great. We're going to try to go. We're going to go around again, and now I want you to tell a story, a memory of Rondo and the Jewish community that, if you had one, that stands out in your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be long. We have. Uh, I'll give you an example. But first, I want to follow up on something that uh, Yusef said about how contained this Rondo community was, and how we felt so secure and how people looked at Rondo as another place in a way. Mm -hmm. And the one story that he forgot was that when young white girls got pregnant, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, yes. they could bring him into Rondo yes. because they knew no one in their family would find him. Yes. And there was a large mansion on the yes. corner of Rondo and Dale Street, it was right, it was right there, the the and had a big yes. long driveway. Yes. Yes. And the limousines would drive them, yeah. drop them off, mm -hmm. and the nuns would walk them around town mm -hmm. because they could be on vacation, they could be away at school, mm -hmm. they would have their child. Sick on Kansas. Pardon? A sick aunt in Kansas. Yes. Yeah. 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 Kansas. And no one would ever come to Rondo to see them. Yeah. I mean, it was that. Is that what became House of All Nations? Do you no, no. I think it, after that school, when it closed there, and we read on on the corner from us on Victor on Milton, uh, Milton, Milton, Milton and Carol, yeah. yeah. right? Yes. And they, the we used to call it Watermelon Hill because <laughs> the girls would eat a watermelon and the they would get Those were the communities that they could come here and they could do things yes. and. They would never, and they could go to a gambling house over here. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they could take, bring their hard-earned cash, and mm -hmm. they could go to places that stayed open after 12 o'clock right. to 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. It would be an integrated gambling house. <laughs> that was part of the Rondo history, part of the Rondo ethos. So it was a community that was shared. And the other thing I want to share real quickly, 
We have a friend that we all grew up with. His name was Roland McFarlane. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yes. Roland McFarlane. Michael's brother. Michael's brother. Yes. He was my debutante date. He was your debutante <laughs> date. He was my best, one of my best friends. Roland, was, Roland became quite a, 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 a painter and, and an artist. Yes. And back in 1999, uh, Roland decided that he was going to throw his memories of Rondo together again, somewhat of a map. Oh, wow. So I'll pass it around. Yes. But Roland's memory goes way back, and some of the things he goes back to is <coughs> it's the old colored YM and YWCA, Hallett Hugh Brown. But then he mentions uh, all of the Jewish grocery stores that we would go to. Uh, the White Front, uh, mm -hmm. the White Front grocery store, and uh, Elbert's, Elbert's gro uh, grocery store, and Rosenblum, uh, Rosen, Rosen's grocery store. Was and there a cut price somewhere in there at one yeah. time? Was there a cut price? price? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Grotto, yeah. Grotto, yes. Uh -huh. uh, Grotto. Mm -hmm. and Abel's and Grotto and Central? There was one right on the corner of uh, Chatsworth and uh, so and I go hard. That's right. Norman's? Yeah. Was that oh, Norman's? Oh, that was, uh, no. Uh, okay, because that was on the same block as my grandparents. What was the name of that? Schaefer's. No, Schaefer's was on Schaefer's was down. Oh, this is one. And Halpern's was on okay. Selby. Right. Albert's was on Selby and Chasworth. Right. And <coughs> so this one was on I go hard and Chasworth. I go hard and Chasworth. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But all of the young guys would work there as a takeout mm -hmm. guy mm -hmm. and work that out. Because Gooden's was ended up. Uh, oh, yes, several yes. years later. Yeah. So there always was a rich, rich, uh, rich community, and my personal story goes back to when my my parents moved to 755 Iglehart Avenue between Iglehart, Avon, and Grotto. Across the street were the Johnsons. Next door were the Levine family. Uh, Philip, Michael, and. I'll tell you a story about Marvin Levine, and it has a lot to do with my name. And next to them were the Schmoliaks, who ran the grocery store on the corner of uh, Grotto I would have and moved. I would have moved with all those people there. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to close down on Saturday yeah. afternoon mm -hmm. because of the, it was Sabbath, the, the Sabbath. Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up with these memories. And I was a very young boy, I think it was about two or three years old. And my name is Marvin Anderson, Marvin Roger Anderson. But next door to me was Marvin Levine, and Marvin Levine Ish. would walk out of the house and sit on the stairs, and that was the extent of his day. He would leave the house, he would go to the stairs, and he would just sit there and his parents would say, are you, when are you going to get a job? When are you going to go to school? And he would just sit there and smoke cigarettes. And so my name was Marvin at the time. And one day they got so mad at him. They said, you bum, just get out of here and don't come back. So I walked into the house and his name was Marvin. And my name was Marvin. And I told to my mother, I said, Mother, do I have another name? <laughs> and she said, yeah, your middle name is Roger. Oh, I said, so well, call me Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Marvin because he's being thrown out of the house. <laughs> and I refused to be called, I mean, as long as I was not going to get thrown out of my house. And I was going to be called a bum. So I said my name was Roger and finally it just took over and so all the way from grade school, uh -huh. uh, all the way through Hallie Drew Brown, I was Roger Anderson until I went away to college. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. So I go to college and I have to fill out the registration thing the right way. I had to put Marvin, you know, uh, Anderson on there. So one day we're sitting in this room like this and the guy says, Marvin Anderson. Uh, you can come forward now. I'm sitting there. <laughs> Marvin Anderson, come forward. I said, oh, that's, that's it. <laughs> I know it says my name is Marvin Anderson here, but I got to tell you a story about it. <laughs> and he looked at me and he says, boy, what's this say right here? I says, Marvin Anderson. He said, shut up and sit down. <laughs> so from... 
<laughs> From that moment on, 1958, I'm Marvin Anderson. But here in Rondo, here in the community, okay. as long as I'm with them friends, I'm Roger. <laughs> that's and so that's how I got the two names. And I thank Marvin, Marvin, Marvin Levine for giving me another name and giving my real name back. Mm -hmm. And I've never been thrown out of the house. We talk about that all of the time. So that's my story. So, Marvin yeah, and Philip. Yeah, <laughs> Marvin and Philip Levine. Mm -hmm. uh, The Smoliak family, uh, Ricky went on to become a, a semi-pro uh, hockey player. Uh, his brother went on to become a piano player, was one of the founders of Best Buy um, uh, Electronics. Mm -hmm. uh, Stevie Goddess, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, Steve Birdie, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Winnick, mm -hmm. uh, Marv Schumeister. Mm -hmm. uh, Red all the guys that we meet once a, once a month for, for uh, lunch down at Cassettes. Did you know that Mark Schumeister was a bat boy for the St. Paul Saints? I didn't know that. I know. But those were the people that I grew up with and have remained friends with for the most, of my, most of for over 70 years we've been friends. So that's my story. So I'm wondering, do you know what happened to Marvin Levine? No, no, Marvin, Marvin, I think Marvin, they moved out to uh, St. Louis Park. I understand that some of the Jewish community from Rondo moved to St. Louis Park. Uh, if they didn't go to Highland Park, and there's a large Jewish community in St. Louis Park, I understand. Mm -hmm. Yes, never. Netanyahu's grandparents. Pardon? Netanyahu's yeah. grandparents. Up from there. St. Louis Park. Okay. Originally on our side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. if you didn't look for Rondo, we're but, going to but try I, to go around. Actually, Quick I, story. I do have a, a Rondo okay. story, but it's from about, about a week ago. So, because I didn't have a personal history in Rondo, but my family did. Uh, when Mr. Anderson and I met and Norma a uh, week, two weeks ago to talk about this meeting, um, just in the course of conversation, I mentioned that my aunt and uncle had a grocery store in Rondo, mm -hmm. and immediately he knew the name, and it made me feel so much a part of it, and thought, that was, that was really something, that was really my family. I didn't know my uncle, he passed away before I was mm -hmm. born. My aunt passed away when I was eight, so it's been a long time. They were um, Rose and Jack Diamonds, mm -hmm. and they had a store over on... Um, Right on Rondo, I believe. You, you can see the building from St. Albans. St. Albans. Before the co-op. Before the co-op. The diamonds. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, wow, that's from, you know, even really before my time and, you know, part of this community. Mm -hmm. Is anybody that was from, from McGill's? Or I'm sorry? Anybody from McGill's? Yeah, McGill's, he's, um, his really? grandson okay. is, has joined the, the he's been at, most of the events that we have. So yeah, I've made contact with him. So it's a level, round of story. If somebody's got one, I'm gonna keep moving. So, yes. so I'll just go quickly. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, okay. um, so, so I don't have a, a personal story, but I have a secondhand story. So I thought I would just relay it quickly and you probably can finish the story or correct mm -hmm. the story. So I was at the Selby Jazz Festival a year ago and a Jewish gentleman starts talking to me and he's explaining that back in the 40s or 50s, um, the Jews would be playing basketball against the blacks, and so it was always the Jews against the blacks. And, <laughs> and he said that it was because um, in, the, in the Rondo community, I don't know if it was that either, I don't know what, if there was a different helicopter ground that also had a, a rep or a, a gym there, but he was saying that the whites wouldn't come in and play the blacks, and so, and the Jews had the same problem, no one would play them. So they would end up playing each other because, because no one would play them. So I don't know if no anyone's heard any, had any experience heard like that before. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> because we did form uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. Not just because the whites wouldn't play the Jews and the black people, because the white kids would try to beat up the Jews and the blacks. Mm -hmm. And my time at Central. Yes. Yeah and mm -hmm. they would band together for mm -hmm. protective purposes as well. Right. Oh yeah. Yes, yes. Quick story. I just, I want to say <clears throat> to this gentleman that spoke of Louis, Louis House. Mm -hmm. Louis House was a counselor. He was here. Right. He was a counselor at Hallie Q. Brown Center. <laughs> so if you have something 
to to give to them, they, that would be wonderful because uh, he mm -hmm. was one of the counselors here. Oh, he yes, he was. And another thing that I want to say, because like I said, I grew up in this center. And one thing that I learned that the counselors had taught us as children, you're not going to win all the time. So you have to learn <coughs> how to be a good loser. Mm -hmm. and, and when you spoke of Louis, mm -hmm. that's, that's how he was. And that's what he taught here. And that's the way he was. Yes, he was. Yes, that's he the was. way he lived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I admired him. Yes. Even he was a couple years younger than me, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I really liked him. Yes. And he, yes. It, 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 he was not somebody I hung around with. But he's a guy I just admired seeing. Mm -hmm. And and when we did when we did get together and just talk, he was a great guy. Yes. Did you know that Lou House became the first? African American radio announcer. Yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He had a radio show, W W D G Y, and Lou House was a he was a broadcaster. Yeah, the first one. Yes, the dancer. Yeah. I'll be there. The dancer. Quick story. Uh, let me see real quick. But uh, a couple of things. Uh, I recall there was some relationship, and this is so faint, but it was a relationship between Pilgrim Baptist Church and one of the Jewish synagogues. I can't remember exactly where it was, but I remember because I was about 12 years old. I was, I was, I think in elementary school, and I was uh, in BY at Baptist Youth Fellowship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had the youth get together, and I remember being because I was the president of BYF and mm -hmm. the spokesperson, and we would go to the synagogue and we would talk about our experiences, what it was like to be a Negro, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we would hear what it was like to be you know, Jewish living. So it was really at that young age an exchange of um, cultures and learning about each other's culture. And then another quick story that is not really a very pretty story, but I recall that uh, Susan's mother and my mother became good friends because we were both in, I think it was Girl Scouts or, or Campfire Girls. Um, I think it was Susan's seventh birthday. She wanted to have a party and her parents ask her what would she like to do? Would she like to have a party or would she like so she wanted to have a party and would she like to have come and so she named me Paulette Starks and then there were some white girls as well as some other Jewish girls. So the white parents said their their kids would not come to the party as long as there were gonna be Negroes there. Mm. So then her parents said, Okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to have the party and and exclude your 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 Negro friends or do you want I mean her parents were and my parents were very good about having these conversations. And she said if her black friends <coughs> if her Negro friends couldn't come, she did not want to have a party. So she has lived by those um, standards, in fact, became a very, I think she was with uh, Northwest um, Telephone Company, and um, doing work in justice and equity. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's one of the stories that um, we started out very young with justice and equity and really advocating for each other's cultures mm -hmm. and learning about each other. When I go to, uh, if I'm going to a bar mitzvah, I call Susan. Now what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to take? What's <laughs> she called me the other day and she said, you forgot Yom Kippur. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I said, no, Rosh Hashanah. I said, Happy New Year. Be late. And then I called her and I said, now what am I supposed to say about good Yatish? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I could call my other Jewish friends and give them a right degree. <laughs> Still learning. Yeah. Gail, you have a quick story? I don't know. Steve? Yeah. I, I guess I got a couple, and I'll make them really uh, fast. But uh, in what I'm going to say from when I was very, very young, uh, there's two businesses that I think a lot of you would be familiar with. One was Road Buddies, yeah. and one was Square Deal Liquor. Right. Uh, and um, I had, I think if I have it right, there was a relationship between those businesses, and the one was a gentleman by the name of Morris Goldberg, Moisha with Goldberg. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of, I have it right, the backing or the money behind them, okay? Uh, later on, I know for sure his son had Bud, Square Deal Liquor, mm -hmm. and then he also had Goldberg Bail Bonds. Bail you see them all over. Yeah. So I know that very intimately, and I hope I have the road buddies right. I think I do, because mm -hmm. they were very good friends with us. What was Chet's last name? Oh, 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 oh. Chet. Okay. But the other story I want to share with you was when I went to Marshall Junior High, mm -hmm. 
And in 1960, I won the election there of being vice president of the student council. Mm. Okay? And I wanted to have a little party. And now this was related to me, uh, I'm going to say maybe 55 years later after the party. And one of the people I invited to my party was a gentleman by the, my age, was named Carl Griffin. Yes. And Carl Griffin, I think his dad worked there at the Union Depot, he told me, that we were 12 or 13. In this party, nobody had a house to hold a party except for one girl, and that house was at 597 Summit, <laughs> next to F. Scott Fitzgerald House, you can imagine. Susie. Yeah, Susie. Yeah, okay. So I invited uh, Carl, I invited others. And Carl told me 50 some years later, he said, You know, Steve, that was unbelievable. I said, what was unbelievable? I didn't even think. She said, even his mother said, you better check to see if you can go to Summit Avenue mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And that was really something. But I never even thought that way. I said, I know you have school with you. And uh, by the way, Mr. McWatt he yeah. was our teacher. Oh, you know, sure. yeah. Yeah. Arthur McWatt. Okay. Yes. Okay. And he came there, but he had a good time in that. But he mm -hmm. said his mother said, you better check again if you're allowed to go. And I never thought the way to even think of that. What year did you graduate from John Marshall? Well, I finished up there in uh, in 62, then I went to Central, graduated 65. Okay. I'm class of 66. Okay, one year beyond, okay. Yeah, because that was a year high. Yeah, 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 yeah I went there to, so that, and I was with, sat next to Leroy Gardner all them years yeah. of school, you know. <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm just everybody, and I went, I remember the introductory speech by, uh, uh, gee, why did his name escape me? He was the head of the general college at the U of M. Yeah. David, 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 David Taylor. 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 And Jeannie Collins gave the wonderful introduction yeah. speech for me. Yeah. I always remember that. You might remember my brother, Evan Anderson. He yes, yes, I do. Yes, yes. But anyway, so that was my little story, you know. And I can relate many, many more from just things that I recall. That time. So we'll go ahead. Okay, Norma. Yusuf, I just want to thank you very, very much for clarifying why we had to leave Central. We did not leave easily. Our parents were sold a bill of goods. And here's this brand new, beautiful Highland Park Senior High. And I happened to live one block away from it. And my parents said, you have a choice. You either go or you take three buses to Central. We're not driving you. So a group of us, you know, 240 is how many kids were in our graduating class. We go marching into Highland Senior High. Not a picture on the wall. Not a, 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 you know, and here we had come from Central. Now why are we sent here? What, what did we do so wrong? Why can't we be with our friends? Well, they needed to get that school open fast so that they could get the money to have school. So we had our 70th birthday party a couple weeks ago, Carl Griffin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, well, you, what are you complaining about, Norma? You went to school with a swimming pool. I said, where was the swimming pool? I said, the walls weren't even finished yet. We didn't have a swimming pool. You know, we went with bare nothing. We took red from Central and white from Monroe, and they threw some of those long wooden rifle things and the girls uh, I'm not going to be on any dance line for Highland Park. It means nothing to me. And we struggled through that year, and we never knew, our parents never told us that they really didn't have a choice because in came the kids from Wilson that took our places at our desks, and that sort of was the... Now, both my sisters graduated from Central. Why couldn't I? What's one year difference, you know? So, um, I, I, I just heard that, and it took 55 years for me to hear why 
I had to go to that lousy Highland Park movie school. We had our 50th um, high school reunion last year, and the kids who came to Central from Wilson sat on one side of the room, and the kids from Central sat on the other side of the room. So that, that rep never did go. Mm -hmm. Get over it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had, you know, Leroy Gardner came over to our school. A couple of the great athletes somehow got talked in to coming, so we'd have some kind of a team because we were a bunch of wimps. I mean, we didn't have any, you know, and we were so used to going to all these rah rah rahs. So I, I thank you very much for bringing that up because we didn't run away from anybody. There. John, do you want to say anything? Or are you just taking notes? I'm just taking notes. Okay. I'm just saying, you know, um, you already know how old I am. I'm 76 and 59 out of Central. That's a 59. My friend, growing up, we were all people, you know. You just, it's your neighbors, your friends. You played with them. You, you were there. That's your worry. Your life's made up of going different directions, but stay. Unless I went to mechanics. Well, you live the wrong side of Western. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that right. The um, <coughs> um, I became very close friends. And I'm not saying that I'm not close friends. They're my close friends. I've got a lunch bunch that I've been going to lunch minimum three times a year for the last 60, 65 years. And I showed a picture to a couple of people that just this last summer. This is long before I knew I was coming here. But I'll mention some family names. Half of them went to McKinley. Mm -hmm. um, um, Charles McIntosh, mm -hmm. Arthur Benner, mm -hmm. Pete Few, Herman Few, mm -hmm. Freddie Slemons, mm -hmm. Marty Abel, Abelowitz, uh, Pooker McNeil. <laughs> we, we get together <coughs> minimum three times a year. We've been doing that for years. And why? We enjoy each other's company. We've all been to each other's weddings, wedding or weddings. Um, <laughs> Marty, but it, Marty comes to Toronto every year. I know, I go with Marty to Toronto. We didn't go this year. Um, I this went year. this year. We didn't go this year. Marty Abel, a Bellowitz, uh, Abel, he loved to walk around. He loved to go to the park and sit and talk to young ladies who might have remembered the store because the next generation have no idea. And he would love to see when they grab his hand, the older citizens would grab his hand and say, oh, I remember Murph, I remember your father at the store. Mm -hmm. We would get credit, all we had to do was just go and sign our name and, yeah. and uh, yeah. sign your name and mm -hmm. we got paid and that's the way it was done. Mm -hmm. You had to have the mutual respect of each other to do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I'm just saying, the, um, um, we shop, yeah, downtown St. Paul and here's a trivia question for later. <laughs> In the 1950s, 40s and 50s, there were seven movie theaters downtown St. Paul. Think about it and see if you can remember what you got. Oh, I know. Tower, Lyceum, World, Paramount. Yeah. Paramount. You guys are in the world. I forgot one already. It's the Garrett. Right. Oh, Garrett. And, um, Garrett, the Garrett. And, um, Damn. Tower had seven balconies. But yeah. the Beaux Arts? Where was the Beaux Arts? Beaux Arts was the Selby. Selby. And what was the name of the theater Foss. that Ted Mann, original Ted Mann, who is man entertainment. Yeah. The RKO? The Dell? That guy, guy just started here at what theater? Was it the Dell? Nope. Was it the Lexington? Nope. No. Ted Mann. Okay. Ted Mann. Ted I Mann. The Ted, Ted Mann. I know you're talking about. about. The Ted, Ted Mann. Man. The guy that started the Oxford. Who said that? I said that. You said the Oxford Theater. That was my neighborhood theater. That yeah, was mine. Oxford. Yeah. Yeah. We we got got we that's why I'm running down. I got one more subject to go after you do it. Do you have a personal story? I'm not really. Rondo. Meryl? I had one. <laughs> Meryl, while you think Meryl's about it, I'll tell a Marty Abel story. What? While you think about it, I'll tell a Marty Abel story. Okay. okay. Because uh, we, we grew up in the Flats, which was the red brick row houses right across from Pilgrim Baptist Church. Okay. And I used to hang out at uh, Abel's grocery store. Yes. And a lot of the delivery men were Jewish. And whenever they would come in the store, Marty, the old man, would talk to them 
in Yiddish or in Hebrew. And I would always say, what are you guys talking about? And he said, if you really want to learn the language, I'll teach you. So he taught me a string of about 35 words, which I had to memorize. Can you say it in public? No. <laughs> and every time one of the delivery men would come in, I would spew out this string of 35 Yiddish and Hebrew words, all of which were epithets. And the delivery men would roll around on the floor and laugh for 50 minutes. What's, what's this little color kid doing, you know, swearing at me in our language? And then I would get a bottle of cream soda or a cherry pie or whatever. And so that was how I earned my treats back in the day, uh, entertaining the Jewish drivers who made drop-offs, hostess and and uh, Old Dutch and everything else mm -hmm. at the grocery uh, store. I, I, I see and talk to Marty, and I'll, I see, uh, see and talk to all the guys you just mentioned. Uh, yeah, we Marty, email, we email. Marty is supposed to be here. I didn't, yeah. he was not feeling well. Okay, Meryl, go ahead before, uh, you, before you forget. This, this happens to be, the, the first part of this is Jewish, because I remember going down Selby Avenue, looking at the south shore, the south side of the street, on the same block where the high school is, mm -hmm. and there was nothing. The, every store in that whole street was Jewish, Yiddish. Mm -hmm. There were, and which to me tells me there were quite a few Jews around. You're talking about <coughs> between uh, St. Albans and Be, Grotto, Dale. The same block that yeah. contains Marshall High School, that block. The Grotto, south Grotto, side Grotto, of the street, every, every store yeah. in the whole, and that's a really long block. Butcher, butcher shops, was, yeah. butcher stores, everything. Charles, yeah. Charles Department yeah. store. Charles Department, oh, Charles yeah. department yeah. store. Yeah. So we knew there were a lot of Jewish. Levine printing on the north side. Levine printing. Charles on the north side. Yeah. Sits and where? No, Charlie had a pair of gold shoes in the store window for 20 they years. They had shoes there. <laughs> yeah, Charles. Exactly. And he had a big boys department. You that's where mm -hmm. you and of course, <laughs> and of course, that means there was a lot of Jewish people in that high school, and there was a, your, your percentage from Rondo, and and a co few of us Scandinavians, and, and especially Irish, because it's not that far from the cathedral, and that was a, an integrated school, and nobody knew what the word integrated meant. Mm -hmm. right. No, well, Saint Paul had integrated schools in the 1850s. He was a mayor of Boston. Integrated public schools. And I don't remember, I don't even remember an argument about who people were. We played, we were all playing, when we go out to play in the playgrounds, we were all play, we were mm -hmm. team members, we, we, <coughs> we were one people, I believe, <coughs> in my, at those days. Too bad we had to grow old. Yeah, but, yep. Would you like to say something of the second round? Um, I, I know a secondary story. Okay, great. When Norma started her, you know, everything took on shape. You know, I uh, talked to patrons and um, one patron was doing research. And I said, have you by chance lived on Selby Avenue? And he said, well, I was in the neighborhood. I forgot, I'm sorry. Baby. That was Mr. Norma, you know his name? Well, no. Talk a little bit more. Oh, yes. So he says he was um, playing with children and he had a little Jewish friend. And then the priest came mm -hmm. and said, I need an altar boy for mass. <laughs> and then he said, you, you come with me. And then the boy said, Jewish boy said, my father, I'm Jewish. Uh, you come with me, and all so <laughs> so say Shanghai, them. and then all the other kids went. He, he, he has to go priest, you know. So um, I said, really? I don't think that would happen to in these days, you know. <laughs> so was that the fellow that lived in your building? No, 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 no. It's the fellow that you can never get a hold of. He gave us oh, a phone number. Oh, Mr. Broderick? Yes. <laughs> I and finally got an anybody know John Broderick? Yes. yes. He was a, a principal, he said, he at the high school. school. Well, he was a teacher no. at Washington High School. Yes. There's He's on a the school board. Another fellow, He's though, he lives out in, um, in North Oaks or something. And um, I have his name out in my car. But his answering machine keeps saying, hello, I'm not available, leave a message. And then you leave a message, 
and then the next time you call, hello, I'm not available, please leave a message. And I've been leaving a message for like two years now. And he doesn't call me back. That must be a different one then. Yeah, That's that, not John Broderick. Oh, okay. John lives on Charles. All right. So it's now 11.15, and we, are, we were scheduled to go to 11.30. I, you can stay till you know, just carry on your conversation. Don't worry about Okay, but I, I know you may have some to people, if you have to leave, leave, and I know I have to leave, yeah. because I did want to ask, ask, the last thing I wanted to do was to have everybody go around and just express what this meant to them today, and because there's one topic that we don't have, we don't have enough time to discuss today, it's what happened to the Jewish and the black relationship. Be, what happened? And we got to just put it on the table because there was a period of time where this Jewish and the black relationships within African American community became strained nationally. And that was a very difficult time for me because the Jewish community was being cast in a certain way and the reactions were, mm -hmm. and I don't know if it was part of the Southern strategy to divide people, the political people would <laughs> come in and separate it, but I know we, we remained strong, so acknowledge that there was a, a split, but then how we <coughs> overcome that split, how we rebuild that split, and how we make people understand that you can't divide groups because of a political strategy, a, a southern strategy, to divide and conquer people. So I would love, I would love to have that conversation one another time. I just want to put time. a question out there, though. I wonder if some of that emanated from the entertainment industry. That's, those are questions Ooh. I know. Those are questions that I'd like to explore. So what I wanted to go around and ask right now is, would you come back again? Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yes. And so if you would say that, and then say something. What would you like? To, how would we improve this? How could we make it larger? What we could do again? Should we do a longer time? So I just want everybody to put out there very quickly. One, I would like to do this again. I'd like to explore some of the painful <laughs> questions and then why and then how we make this healing, this redemption, if it has to be, so it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. So I'd say yes. And um, from, one, yes. Yes, one, yes. from my perspective, um, for the organization and for sort of the vision of, of something coming out of it, I think it's important to tell all sides of the story, mm -hmm. um, not just what looks pretty, and sometimes that's what gets, gets told. Mm -hmm. And I think there's always going to be a lot of different sides, the good, the bad, the, mm -hmm. the uh, whatever. Um, so I think it would be really important and useful and... Um, I'm not sure how it should look, if it should be big groups or smaller groups, but you know, things to think about. But I think it would be really nice to continue down this path. Okay, you said? I would love to come back, uh, Marvin Roger. And <laughs> uh, I would love for us to have some very serious conversations. I think one of which is, for a lot of black people, what is a Jew? You know, is it a religion? Is it a race? Is it a Middle Eastern nationality? Is it a political organization? <laughs> Um, and I think that, um, you know, then what is an African American, mm -hmm. okay, is the other side of that question. I think there are some, some very uh, tenuous tensions between uh, blacks and Israel, mm -hmm. okay, uh, blacks and Palestinians. 90% um, of the people on this planet who worship the Hebrew faith are what the Jewish community refers to as Oriental Jews, Jews of color. Only 10% of the Jews in the world would consider themselves white. Okay, and, and I think uh, we really need to have an acknowledgement of what is and what ain't so that there's a level playing field in terms of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tensions began uh, with a group called Basic Black Americans Support Israel Committee that was headed by Bayard Rustin back in the 60s. Then in the 1970s, there was a lot of Jewish support uh, for the Baki lawsuits around affirmative action. 
quotas, and I think that opened up a wound uh, between blacks and members of the Jewish community. Um, there are, uh, as I said, a, a significant number of people of African descent or people of color around the world who themselves are Jews, you know. <coughs> and I always wanted to enter into a conversation with Sammy Davis about blacks and Jews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, these, these are real, these are serious, you know, and I think there's some discomfort in terms of discovering the truth and putting it on the table and that unless you do that, it's difficult to then move on, okay? We, we could link arms and say we shall overcome this morning. But if there's not a common understanding, if there's not some value-added benefit in the conversation, <coughs> that, you know, because if we don't understand how we got to where we're at, we won't have a clue about where we need to go and what we need to be and do, all right? And uh, I'm just so glad to see my old friend Dick Stremling again. We lost a, a very dear friend, which has separated which us. Which has nothing to do with Rondo at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Eric? Um, yes, yeah, so I would say I, I would welcome that conversation as well about those historic tensions. And one, and one reason I think it would actually be really productive is I think a lot of things have changed. Mm -hmm. So to the extent there were justified concerns from either or both sides, I think if we now talked about them, we'd say, oh yeah, that's not true anymore, this is now. So that would be really helpful. Um, yes, I'd like to be invited back. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it would be great. I've heard so many names of people in common that people knew that to the extent that they're still in the community, if there's any way to get them to a meeting, I think it would be great to, to meet them. Great. Gloria? Yes, I'd be willing to come back again. I enjoyed this this morning, mm -hmm. and I love hearing um, different ones uh, call names that, mm -hmm. that I know. So yes, I'd like to be a part of it. Mary Kay? Yes, I would, and I'd like to be a couple of other people. Good point. Did you want to say something, Don? Yes, I want to thank you guys all for coming here today. And one of the things that I would love for you to do is, as we're done with this conversation today, I'd love to walk you guys into our library because you're going to see a lot of familiar faces of the Jewish families that helped with Hallie Q. Brown House. Mm -hmm. And I would love to have you guys come back. And we have photos and businesses that I'm sure a lot of you can help us identify as we are turning Hallie Q. Brown center here into like an interpretive center. Mm -hmm. So as you will walk through the hallways, you will see the history of Rondo and to see your history, mm -hmm. their, their history as everyone's history together. Mm -hmm. So when we're done with this today, I'd love to have you guys just walk through the library. And I will, of course, will always be a part of our okay. conversation. Gail, you. would you yes. like to come back? Yes. Okay. Like Any ideas <clears throat> about the... Uh... I just concur. Okay. Steve? Yes come back. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot and brought back a lot of memories. So I thank you for that. Great. Yes. Norma? Yes, I definitely would want to come back. Um, there were probably 10 more people that said they were coming today that I don't see. So something happened. But, um, and yes, I want to pick up so that our children's generation can experience what we ex and nothing stays the same. There's always changes. That's true, but um, they need to know. They need to know that um, what they're thinking of people living together is not what it is. That's not how the world's going to um, succeed. Okay. I would like to come back if invited, and I think this is terrific because I'm learning a lot. Okay. And thanks for featuring W.T. Francis in the magazine. Yeah, time. that's great. As long as you have yeah, muffins, and cake, <laughs> <laughs> muffins and cake, I will come back. Muffins and cake. I will have muffins and cake. I would love to come back because I have really learned a lot, even though I grew up around here. Mm -hmm. There are some things I remembered and forgot. I just can't forget that. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. I'm enjoying it. All right, great. You live in Iowa, but you're well, welcome I, to come back. I would love to come back, but I'm 96 also. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can't make any long commitment. <laughs> Would you? If I could come back, it would be wonderful. I think nothing is like when people tell the story. You right. can read it in a book, but you people, it comes alive, and it was so interesting. Thank you. If, if, All right. if, there, if there are minutes available, I would love to follow you with minutes. Maybe I can even make some additions okay. from, from things I read. Did you want to say something? I'll introduce it's this please. a little while. Lauren huh? has come to help us 
with our new project here at Halley. She is a new employee that will be helping us with our archive project. So she will be doing interviews, she will be taking the photos and identifying and listening to the stories and digitizing everything. So she is a new part, a new team member of the Halley Q. Brown Community Center. Okay, well here's, here's the final thing. What I think we should do then, Norma, or if we, we should probably get your name and contact yes. information from everybody that was here today. So if you take a moment to, so yeah, why don't I, just photo I want to get a group photo before we leave. I want you to <coughs> come back and get a group photo. <coughs> so leave your name and your name and your contact information, so and then if you would be willing to uh, serve on a kind of like a planning committee, because um, Robin and I will serve on a planning committee to try to understand from this what we might be able to put together for another occasion. Whether or not it's this, if it gets larger, whether or not we should break bread, how we should do that. So we'll do a planning committee thing and then we'll work it out. We'll make a commitment that each one will bring one other person. Because if you get too big, too, too soon, We've established a certain amount of understanding and trust. That's why we went around the room and told personal stories before we get to the next level. So this could be a planning committee for a larger thing. Mm -hmm. So this but is something that we'll plan. Yeah. Know, it, it just appeared to me that there's also, there's a lot of education that's taking place. As you mentioned that you're learning things and so am I. Mm -hmm. There's also healing that's taking place. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There's a lot of holiness, as we all know. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if there's any interest in connecting with the truth, racial healing, and transformation work that's being done through the Kellogg to St. Paul College. At some point. I mean, do we do it now? I don't know. Well, I don't know what we do so it, but I think it's Let's sit down on it. Let's okay. serve a planning committee. And let's get together and spend one day and talk about all of the possibilities, where we want to go with this. It's, it's small, intimate, it's fine. Do we want to take, before we rev it up, sometimes we lose. Let's take our time with it. But I want to thank everybody for responding and being so um, frank and honest with your memories. It really brought back a lot of memories to me just to be in this room, mm -hmm. to know that other people within Rondo and the Jewish community had such warm memories uh, as I have. So I thank you and Robin, I thank you for Very much, thank you very much for being here. Yeah. Um, and I was gonna just make a comment, not exactly related, but it might be of interest to everyone here. Um, there's currently an exhibit at the University of Minnesota at the Elmer Anderson Library on um, racism and anti-Semitism at the University of Minnesota mm. that um, I think everyone should see. Mm -hmm. it, um, it was a real eye-opener. Where is it? It's um, called the Elmer Anderson Library. It's over on the West Bank. Oh, the, yeah. Not the Marvin Anderson. No, not no, the no, Marvin no. Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. All right. um, and it is during the week. It has, you'd have to look on the website. But um, <coughs> excellent exhibit about segregated housing. Um, African Americans were not allowed to live in university housing right. for a very long time, which was a real surprise to me. Yeah. And, Bernard um, Anderson couldn't stay there when she performed at North right, right. So, and I want to, I want to thank Jonathan. I want to thank uh, Don for making uh, Halle Q. Brown available for this. Yes, you sir. One of the things that I'd like to encourage people to do is read an essay that was written by James Baldwin in the 1950s, and the, the title of the essay is "Blacks Are Anti-Semitic Because Blacks Are Anti-White." The content of the article has nothing to do with the title, but I think it really puts black Jewish relationships in a historical context. And he talks about his experience in Harlem as an African American with Jewish merchants in the 1950s. And it's, it's an incredibly, if you read anything by Baldwin, it's one of his finer works. It's really worth reading. Okay, we passed that. If you leave, please uh, get, um, we want to get your names and contact information, and we will probably uh, find the link to that article for you to read in any minute. So I can email it to you. And I would like everybody to gather so we can take a look. Right here. At this time. Yeah, okay, come come right here. Stay right here. Come on. Thank you all for coming. Yes. Line up in the back? Yeah. All right. You can just line up in front of the table. In front of the table. Sit down. Yeah, we can sit down. Okay. Shoes on one side, blacks on the other, gentiles on the other. Shoes on the back. Shoes on the back.
dresser all this time, why they were waiting to probate the estate, to get it all done. And the only people there were Michael and Marilyn, um, Marvin McClure's, who's got his son, Philip, and his wife, Tony, Freddie, my wife, and his son. And that was it. And now, and then we all went out to lunch. And, uh, but anyway. So. Anyway. Several years ago, I said, I need your mailing address because I have a picture of you hugging Paul Wellstone. It was taken out of JCA uh, with Vic Rosenthal, something, uh, Martin Luther King March, something like that too. I was going to mail it to you, and I never did. Now I'm going to. I helped Paul get his first endorsement, fourth congressional. Here's your card right here.
when there was a kid, Bobby Hilton, I didn't even read it. Bobby Hilton, I didn't even I, I fell asleep and paused on playing Jan Bob Taylor and Joy Dwayne's Lives. Well, that was five years ago. I used to go into all this kind of thing like that. I fell asleep. I may have been worried about your answer in the fall. So I'm not going to go into the ground around it. Have you ever seen the pictures in the library? Yeah. But, Thank you. 